campus in the Netherlands of the Vrije Universiteit, the Free University, with uh, over 30,000 students, which is also part of this district. And then we're doing other things like refurbishing commercial property from single to multi-use tenant. Um, but we are uh, also leading design and engineering consultant for one of the largest infrastructure projects and fastest, fastest growing station. Um, and that's what I'm going to be focusing my presentation on. But because of my 15 years in New York, I know that some of the uh, specifics of how we do things in the Netherlands are sometimes hard to grasp without a little bit of context. So I basically have uh, uh, divvied up my presentation in two pieces. First, I'll talk a little bit uh, super high level and absolutely not comprehensively about some unique uh, um, context in, in the Netherlands, which helps, I think, understand how we do things. Then I'll talk a little bit about the planning framework for this project, and then I'll dive into the project itself. So. Um, and my challenge is that if I present, I do not see you. So um, please um, speak up or, or, or post your questions in the chat as we go, and then we'll get to them at the end. And then one more thing, I believe I have some of my colleagues from Arcadis in the Netherlands on this call. And again, I cannot see you guys, but maybe you can post your name in the chat so that others can recognize you as uh, um, uh, colleagues uh, of mine uh, who have joined the call. Um, all right, so without further ado, let me see. Yes, that worked. Uh, a little bit about Arcadis, uh, because you've heard uh, plenty about me, um, but um, Arcadis uh, um, is, is uh, a um, Hmm, I don't have to say that because Rick already uh, told you that. So um, let me go right there. So uh, Arcadis actually has Dutch uh, roots and urban development has been and still is at the uh, core of our business. Um, we were founded in 1888 as the Association for Wasteland Redevelopment or um, Reclam Reclamation Specialist um, and we have been operating under the name Arcadis 19, since 1997. Um, we are well respected within the industry uh, for our own sustainability efforts and have been ranked number one for two years in a row now in the construction and engineering category by Sustainalytics. And that was it, I'll <laughs> no more Arcadis. Um, so as I promised, I was going to give you a couple of reflections on how the Dutch do things and um, provide you with a little bit uh, of context. So um, the Netherlands is celebrated for planning and urban design and architecture uh, uh, and long-term success in building desirable uh, communities. So what sets the Dutch apart? First of all, um, the Dutch have had a head start, partly because urbanization occurred early in the Netherlands. Um, the first cities date back to the Middle Ages, and by the 18th century, 80% of the population of the Netherlands lived in urban areas. And the population density has continued to increase, and today almost 93% of the Dutch live in cities. Um, in such a dense urban environment, people need to share space. And early on, the Dutch designed ways to separate public from private. And the stoop is a buffer between one's home and the space in between buildings. And I would say that shared space is still one of the guiding prim principles of urban design in the Netherlands. Um, secondly, in addition to uh, the early urbanization, the low-lying lands uh, play a large part in the Dutch success in placemaking. For centuries, the Dutch have system, uh, systematically reclaimed areas from the sea. And basically what this means is that everybody has to deal with water. Everybody needs each other. And, and there is always this uh, need to do things together. And I think this also explains why the Dutch are always searching for agreement among all parties. It really is planning by consensus. Um, 
given the investment needed needed to reclaim land, build infrastructure, and make the land ready for uh, construction, uh, there's broad uh, support uh, in in the society for long-term planning at a national regional scale and acceptance that public sector the public sector needs to take the lead. Um, number three. Uh, the Dutch are early adapters. In the 1960s, a Dutch traffic engineer introduced the living street or Woonerf. And this quickly became the standard for new plant communities. And in, 19, in the 1970s, an entire city was designed as a Woonerf. Nowadays, uh, we aspire to the 15 minute city, a city uh, with all you need within walkable distance. Here too, the Dutch, I think, were ahead of the curve. The city of Groningen banned cars from its city center almost 40 years ago. And the city of Amsterdam is absolutely a front runner in, for instance, building of bike parking garages. And um, I actually saw today an article in uh, City Lab uh, about uh, one of the latest uh, bike parking garages, which will be build underwater near Central Station of Amsterdam. And uh, it really explains uh, the reasoning behind um, um, the investment in bike parking. Um, and I'm gonna, and this is, this is a quote, I, I won't read the whole article to you, but I thought it was well, well worded. Uh, basically to reduce car dependency, you need uh, uh, bikes plus a high capacity, high efficiency, high frequency public transit system. Um, and by making it easier to park and store bikes securely at the station, Amsterdam is basically encouraging more travelers to ride uh, to trains, both daily commuting and uh, longer out of town uh, trips. Um, so um, while it seems uh, very costly to build a bike parking underwater, um, in Amsterdam, it's more like a sound infrastructure investment um, because um, in the end, um, you uh, reduce car dependency, but also um, uh, fight the, the societal, um, sorry, the, the public health costs of congestion, car crashes and car dependency. So there, there is a very uh, clear reasoning about that. Um, and the, the last point I wanted to make, and this is, uh, um, unique to Amsterdam, but it is true for more cities in the Netherlands. And it's about owning the land. Um, it's about who owns the land and as a, as a result, who controls the land. So the city of Amsterdam actually owns most of the land within the city boundaries. And rather than selling the land to private developers, the city leases the land in per, uh, perpetuity through a system of land leases. Um, and Amsterdam is actually one of five larger uh, cities in the, in the Netherlands that maintain this system. Um, um, the main reasons being um, fighting speculation and capturing increase in value of the land and use the benefits, uh, revenue to benefit uh, community at large. And this is also tied, ties back to um, the uh, land rec rec reclamation because make the land, you own the land. And uh, this is true for Amsterdam's most recent uh, land reclamation uh, to meet the need for housing, which is in that tiny little uh, uh, gray map, the green area, which actually uh, um, houses 20,000 people today. Sorry, but we were gonna talk about uh, the Amsterdam uh, uh, Zoutas. Um, as promised, um, a little bit of planning framework. I'm sorry, I, uh, I have a cold. I realized I have a dripping nose. I hope you guys can't see it. Um, I'll try not to uh, distract myself. Um, so I think to understand the, um, the way Amsterdam has been uh, growing over centuries, uh, you really need to understand the uh, uh, Amsterdam uh, general extension plan that was uh, developed by a urban designer called uh, Van Eestre. 
1934. And it was actually the first time that um, for, for the city at this scale, uh, a plan was developed, which was based on research and data. You could say that Van Eesten was uh, ahead of his time. And this plan, uh, while not executed uh, because in the 1930s of the, because of the economic crisis worldwide and then the second world war, uh, the plan came in really handy after the world, after the Second World War, when um, Amsterdam was looking to rebuild uh, uh, quickly. And uh, this plan uh, is still the, the blueprint for the city today. And as you can see, the South Oz is actually um, already identified as an area for future growth. It's that red area to the south of the uh, existing. Um, historic city. Um, so now I'm jumping fast forward to the latest uh, uh, long-term plan for the city of Amsterdam that was actually adopted uh, last year and um, is based on uh, five strategic choices. And the first one is to uh, um, accept uh, polycentric growth. The second one is to really uh, concentrate new development within the city boundaries. The third strategy is to focus on healthy living, and that includes promoting walking and biking. And uh, the fourth strategy is really to strengthen and protect, uh, protect, uh, uh, protect the green. And uh, the fifth is working together, and that's the Amsterdam way of saying being inclusive and equitable and um, um, uh, transparent about uh, the city's uh, investment. Um, what I also wanted to point out is that this, this image uh, really shows the uh, green sort of fingers that, that sort of uh, grab Amsterdam. Um, um, and, and sort of make sure that, that in, in between the areas of uh, expansion, there are large green areas that maintain um, enough uh, and sufficient access to green for all um, citizens. Um, and then um, this is a zoom in um, and actually shows even better how um, well-defined those green areas in between a major urban uh, uh, growth is. Um, and it also shows uh, the, uh, um, uh, where the, the, the Zuidas is. I'm actually not sure. Can you guys see my, uh, my, my uh, per, um, cursor? All right, I'm just gonna assume you-, you I'm not seeing see the cursor. No. no, no, that's, that's what I figured. No, but, um, but, so but the, the for, <laughs> Okay, Sorry. so the first plan for a uh, master plan for the city uh, for the uh, Zuidas was actually adopted in 1998. Um, and this was really a break with earlier city planning efforts um, because the city had, had until then, the city had really wanted to develop the Southern uh, waterfront, uh, the water uh, to the north of the historic center of the city, um, which is the Eye River. And, and actually the city had been rejecting the idea to develop towards the south um, as it would be competing for funds and resources. Um, however, the, the city had to change uh, its, um, uh, its, its policy and its planning efforts um, because the, the market basically demanded it. Uh, multinationals, specifically major banks and law and accounting firms were looking for uh, prime real estate near Schiphol uh, Airport uh, with easy access uh, from the highway. And as a result, without a master plan, city uh, was sort of allowing spot zoning to accommodate these, uh, these initiatives. Um, and it was uh, well understood that the city was missing out on an opportunity to leverage major investment that was uh, being done by the national government into infrastructure and transit. Um, and the, the third reason why the city came around to the idea of developing the Zuidas was that the city continued to grow rapidly and was running out of place to build. Um, and the waterfront development turned out to be an extremely complex, expensive, 
and um, um, slow process. And so um, the city did uh, move forward with the uh, waterfront development, but actually chose to uh, work uh, inside out. So started with development east uh, and west of um, the area, uh, just to the north of Central Station, and then worked uh, inward. And in the meantime, uh, Zuidas um, uh, was, uh, was um, uh, becoming uh, a more and more of a uh, central district. Um, anyway, so this is the, uh, the first master plan, again, 1998. Um, and there are a couple of things that I just wanted to point out. I, I personally love looking at uh, uh, plans, especially uh, from, from way back when, and try to understand how we got where we are today. Um, so uh, the first thing is that, that from day one, the city emphasized the existing uh, road network and uh, was looking to make the connection uh, from the north to the south and finding a solution to the highway that was cutting off uh, the southern part of the city uh, from, the, from the neighborhoods to the north. And the other thing that uh, also was emphasized uh, from day one was the large green uh, areas and the green structure to connect uh, parks, cemeteries, uh, recreation areas, sports uh, fields, uh, and the like. And then this, this sketch uh, on the right hand, uh, I think explains really well the options that were considered for uh, uh, overcoming the physical barrier of the highway. Uh, it's basically uh, uh, three options, a dike, a deck, or a duck, and um, I'm gonna tell you they chose the duck, and I'll get to that. So this is the uh, original uh, master plan um, that has been uh, evolving over time. The other thing the city did was they recognized that this was gonna be uh, uh, a, a multi-decade um, uh, uh, project. So this first plan assumed uh, 20 years into the future. And rather than uh, developing a blueprint for the future, uh, they um, treated this as a framework plan uh, with a um, strategy that would allow flexibility uh, moving forward. And that has turned out to be a very wise and smart decision because um, there have been changes in market, there has changed in the economic and financial conditions, costs have been uh, rising and, and forcing uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the parties to reconsider uh, uh, certain aspects of the plan. Um, and um, uh, the, the other thing that was really important from day one is the emphasis on the quality of the public realm. Um, so that is the one thing that uh, um, very specific guidelines were developed. And even today, uh, there is a supervisor whose job it is to uh, assure uh, that the quality of the public realm uh, is front and center in any part of the development. So here are we today. Um, the, um, it's, you, you can recognize the, the, the master plan uh, area it hasn't changed. Um, it's grown a little bit to, uh, to the east and to the west. Um, it's made up by uh, 13 districts, and it's about um, 245 hectares. And this is excluding the uh, infrastructure works uh, to, um, to, the, to deal with the uh, highway that... that uh, cuts through the middle. Um, I have more data, but I'm, I'm, I feel like if you, if, if, if you guys have questions about that, I'll come back to it. So um, that takes me to uh, the, uh, the, where, where we are today. So th this uh, image is about, what, uh, about the time that that master plan that I was just uh, showing was adopted. Uh, this is an image from 2010, and uh, this is 10 years later. This is a, an image from 2020. Uh, um, just for fun, go back, fairly empty. A lot has happened. Um, so um, the, um, the, 
most of the early development was really commercial development, uh, more, more of those uh, offices for uh, financial institutions. Um, and then uh, um, more later development uh, was uh, added uh, residential. And what the plan has been evolving towards uh, is more of a mix, mix of uses. So this is actually, um, so this is still uh, 2020. And uh, one building that you didn't see on the previous slide is uh, this building, which was uh, designed by uh, a Dutch architecture firm called MVRDV. It's called the Valley. And uh, this is truly a mixed use building. It has commercial spaces on the ground floor, um, uh, food and, and drink, uh, as well as uh, cultural uh, destinations. And then uh, on top, uh, apartments that uh, also excelled in, in, in green space. So all these uh, balconies, uh, we were there just a couple of weeks ago, as, as Rick mentioned, have trees and, and, and greenery. Um, and this is right next to it. Um, this is a, uh, um, a, a site and work has, has started to prepare the site for construction. Uh, it's a, going, going to be a residential neighborhood, which will be uh, entirely car free uh, with um, 1,350 homes of which 40% will be uh, um, affordable housing uh, rental. How am I doing on time, uh, Rick? Uh, just just fine, but I don't know how many more slides you have, but take as much time. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm halfway through. I'm, halfway, I'm, I'm halfway through. Okay. Um, Thank you. So so now I'll uh, I'll zoom in on the uh, on the project that uh, Arcadis uh, is uh, working on behind the scenes as the leading uh, en uh, design and engineering consultant. Um, which is uh, Zuid als Dok and um, the uh, station uh, Amsterdam Zuid. Um, th this, is, this is really uh, one of the largest infrastructure uh, projects on the way in the Netherlands. And uh, this station is actually the fastest growing station in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, today, the station handles about uh, 150,000 uh, passengers a day. Um, the station provides a, a direct link to Schiphol Airport um, and uh, Paris and Brussels and Cologne uh, as it connects to the international uh, high-speed rail. Um, it also connects directly to uh, local and regional uh, tram, uh, subway, um, light rail and uh, bus systems. So this is truly a hyper-connected location as it is. Um, but um, the uh, current, in the current situation, it's all separated um, um, by the highway and also um, the, the public uh, space, the connections are not, not as seamless uh, as you uh, may want. So just to dive in a little bit deeper, so, so what's the problem? Um, <clears throat> To very simply put, uh, it's uh, traffic congestion and the highway as a physical barrier, which uh, basically limit the ability of this district to reach uh, full potential. And unless this is solved, um, the, uh, uh, the district also doesn't take uh, full uh, advantage of the fact that they are less than 10 minutes away from uh, um, the city of Amsterdam, as well as the uh, uh, international airport. So the station is, is in the current situation sandwiched in between highways. Um, and um, the solution, uh, and remember that little sketch earlier, uh, the, the dock solution that uh, uh, was an option even way back when, um, that uh, uh, is, is what we're working towards. And by bringing the highway underground, uh, there will be space to expand the station and concentrate all modes of transportation in one place. Um, that's really the gist of it. So um, the, what, what's the main goal here? Um, it really is to, to, uh, 
to provide uh, access and to uh, um, and, and to create room to grow. Um, Um, and I mentioned that the station already is uh, moving 100, uh, 150,000 people a, uh, a day. Um, and the expansion of the station is, uh, is uh, to accommodate a projected growth to 250,000 people a day. So um, what's the main challenge? Well, it really is to maintain operations during construction. Uh, to um, spatially organize the multiple modes of transportation within the station and its surroundings. And it is especially challenging due to the limited space available. So I, I love this image. This is uh, fair, fairly recent. Um, uh, and, it, and, and you can actually see uh, where the new passageways uh, underneath uh, the rail will, uh, will uh, come. So I'm zooming out again a bit to uh, to really make you make you understand and see the scope of this uh, this project. Um, it's really uh, four key components, uh, and I'm now talking about the infrastructure project at large. It's first of all, it's widening the uh, the existing highway and relocating it partially underground. It's to redesign two major uh, highway junctions. Um, and expanding and upgrading the station, as I mentioned. And then of course, redesigning and adding new public space around the station to uh, stitch it all together. Um, maybe I should have mentioned uh, not only that, that Arcadis is working on it, but um, uh, who our client is in this case. Um, our client is a, uh, and we've been working on this uh, since 20, 2012, and even before uh, what we were engaged in uh, feasibility studies and, and phasing studies. Um, our client is a, is a project organization that represents the interests basically of three parties, um, Ministry uh, of Public Works and Water Management, uh, ProRail, who's the, the operator of the National Rail Work, and the city of Amsterdam. So these are three public parties that have joined forces and uh, formed a shared uh, project organization. And we directly work for and with them. Then there are two other major stakeholders. One is the Regional uh, Transit Authority, and the other one is the Dutch Railroads, uh, who, who um, they provide the services and they are the owner of transit facilities. So they own the station. And all the funding is uh, public. And the largest funding, funder is the Ministry of Public Works and Water Management, um, as this is uh, mostly driven by the national government in terms of money. All right, got that out of the way. Um, so construction started in 2018 and is scheduled to be finished in 2029. Um, so this will give you some sense of what it's gonna look like. Um, the, the new station has three uh, island platforms for trains, two island platforms for uh, subway, and then two uh, other platforms for, for tramway. And then there will be a nine stop bus terminal uh, with a separate buffer for regional and local services. Um, well, this is another view. I think the other obvious uh, um, intent here is to green all the roofs to the extent possible and especially the areas that cover the uh, highway um, uh, tunnel um, and create as much parkscape as possible. Um, so this is a view of the uh, new station with a uh, expanded passageway through the middle. 
which is not just uh, for people to walk through. It, it leads directly to the platforms. Um, and it also um, has retail and other amenities lining the, uh, the passageway so that you have a comfortable, um, attractive and safe uh, environment at all times of the day. Um, this um, shows you a little bit better the, uh, where the, the roadway uh, goes under, underground. Um, it's uh, two tunnels that will be covered in park space, like I mentioned. Um, hmm, this is not very uh, sharp, uh, but this section basically shows the two tunnels to the north and the south of the station uh, with the trams on the south side and the bus terminal to the north side of this new uh, station. Um, and then uh, on top of a, a, a passage for uh, pedestrians. I love this little diagram. Um, planning shows uh, complexity. Um, it's also uh, clear that, that there are multiple projects uh, going on at the same time. It basically shows 10 distinct pieces of the puzzle. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but uh, um, the, uh, the uh, projected completion of the entire project, including building over the highway as well as uh, the new station um, is uh, um, projected to be 2036. <laughs> and this is a summary that basically uh, of, of all the things happening. And there's a couple of things that I haven't mentioned yet. So I'll just go ahead. One bike parking for 3000 uh, uh, bikes underground uh, has been completed. Uh, two more will be uh, included in the new station, adding another 5,500 parking spaces for bikes. Um, the, two the two tunnels that will, uh, where, where the traffic will go, uh, each about uh, one kilometer long. Um, the station currently has four tracks with room for two more. So this is, there is still future reservation for future uh, growth. And the new station will have four tracks for uh, Metro and light rail. And then the um, highway is basically uh, consists of 12, 12 lanes of traffic, four of which uh, for local and then split through the middle uh, um, in, in two tunnels. I'm getting to the end of my presentation. So it, it's complex and a lot of information. And if you are a urban planning nerd like myself and a, and a more of a visual learner, uh, you really should check out the uh, Zoutos Information Center. I know the, the group that was uh, in Amsterdam with Rick uh, went there and they have uh, this fantastic model. Uh, it's huge. Uh, that was just updated. Uh, so it's pretty much uh, uh, the latest, greatest. Uh, and it really, really helps understand the magnitude, the, the size and the scale and the complexity of this project, as well as how it uh, relates to the surrounding uh, uh, city. So I took pictures of the model um, because I'm such a planning nerd. Um, but uh, uh, it does also help uh, explain the uh, the station in the in the in the new uh, situation. Um, they also, if you if you're not in, in Amsterdam in person, they do have a great website as well with a ton of information. So this pretty much takes me to the end of my uh, presentation. Um, like I said, I had more facts and figures, but um, I don't want to bore you with too much detail. Um, so. Uh, I figure I just it, wait and see what the questions are. It's not, not, not at all boring. This has been a great presentation. There have been a lot of compliments uh, in the chat room, uh, including from um, uh, some of the uh, uh, key uh, folks in the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization, uh, Lance J. Brown, immediate past president. And I might just jump before he has to jump over to another meeting at the UN to his question that was partially answered by the diagram that you showed, Renee. But mm -hmm. how many crossings will there be? This is Lance's question. Uh, how many for crossings? The corridor, uh, and at what intervals? The diagram showed where they were, the yellow and black diagram, but it's yeah. not to mention uh, approximately how far between these uh, uh, points uh, is it? It looks it's like a, a city. It's, it's 120 or? meters. 
So yeah, okay. it's about a city block. Remember those those earlier aerials? Um, yes. So the the width of of the the existing uh, roadway with the station in between um, is maintained. So so we really have to work within the confines of the existing uh, um, roadway. Um, and then the the passageways uh, are about the uh, they're they're twice the width of a regular uh, street yeah. in Amsterdam. So, so when we... um, I I know you can't see my cursor, but when, when you see the to the um, uh, east and west, you have two roadways, Parnassusweg and Beethovenstadt. Those are sort of your typical uh, urban city streets. And you can see the passageways are about uh, twice the width. Yeah, no, I, I, I could see that. And when we were there together, uh, we walked through the uh, central one where, again, without a cursor, it's labeled uh, Mahler Plain in, in mm -hmm. the white space in the very center. Yeah. Um, and that connects uh, to the current uh, uh, buildings where uh, Arcadis is located presently. And is a rather wide underground passageway. I think part and of that's the temporary. Yeah. yeah, that's what, what, that, that, that's not the final situation. So actually, right. that is in our minds, it's cramped <laughs> for for what we're looking to achieve, which is a much more airier and roomier uh, and also higher space. Yeah. You know, I've, I've got a score of questions, some of which I've written down, but there are so many good ones uh, coming from the chat room in the audience. I'm going to jump to uh, one from Frank Rusick, who asked, how does collaboration and decision making work between uh, the different uh, sectors? And particularly, he's asking about public transport sectors. You've got different right. modes of transit. Uh, um, good cooperation or is it a struggle? It is a good cooperation, but uh, we do have a, a critical party here, which is the uh, the regional transit authority, which basically acts on behalf of all the different uh, transit agencies. And um, um, so it, it doesn't make it easier. It's very complicated and complex, uh, and it requires a, a ton of coordination. But um, um, this this is this is inherent to a, a project of this magnitude and all parties uh, understand that. And ultimately, um, uh, I think I can safely say there is there's absolute buy-in in, 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 the, in what we're trying to achieve here. So everybody has a lot, to, stands a lot to gain. I, I, I don't have Does a- Does that personal... answer the question? <laughs> I, I think so. I think so, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move beyond that. Um, the, the um... The, 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 some of the material that I uh, was able to take away from the information center uh, talks mm -hmm. about sustainability issues and connectivity issues. Uh, the Dutch translation um, of, of, of this one says, uh, uh, if, I, if, I, if I know Dutch at all, uh, thank you, Google. If, you, if, if I can, can I glance, stop sharing? Uh, uh, yeah, no, please, please do that. That'll be good. Because be then I can see you. And if you hold something yeah, up, I can that, actually. Uh... Okay, right. So, so I'm holding up <laughs> something that says uh, that the district becomes even more accessible because of the project that you were describing. Yes, yes, as, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the material uh, that that the uh, yeah, government that's the guy <laughs> talks a lot about connectivity and uh, um, yeah. and, uh, and and sustainability is the special issue of that magazine was all about how green it is. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you pertain to you know the continuity of green space. You talked about the, the green fingers and how uh, large green areas provide access to green for all the citizens of Amsterdam throughout the city. And we saw that viscerally. How does that mentality come into the guidelines for this new district? Uh, uh, is it project by project or is there an overarching uh, master plan that talks about there, what spaces there, will be free from development? That's a great question. And, um, yes, there is a uh, master plan for public space with very um, uh, descriptive um, guidelines. And like I said, the uh, uh, there is actually uh, a supervisor whose job it is to uh, review plans in order to maintain the quality that we all try to achieve, which is a uh, high, high quality urban environment. 
And it's not just architectural, it's not just landscape architectural, it's not urban design. Um, it, it also um, deals with the, um, the phase of the buildings, the way they touch the, the ground, uh, where entrances are, where um, how, how literally the surfacing, uh, surfaces of the, the surface treatment of the street and the sidewalk where it touches the building. Um, so there's a lot of uh, thought uh, and not just thought, um, yep. but direction in terms of uh, how to maintain a uniform and high quality uh, public realm. Um, and, and when we were walking around with you and your students, I, I kept pointing it out uh, because it's a very rich treatment. It's not rigid, it's rich. So there's a different, there's a lot of different uh, materials to, um, uh, to, to make sure it doesn't start to feel like too, uh, like a, a, a concrete jungle or, you know, you, you can overdo it with, with uniformity if you don't have enough, enough richness and, and, and sensitivity around the materials that you use in the public realm. Uh, and you know, in the uh, in your description of some of the other projects, including those that we were fortunate enough to see with you, uh, um, uh, you mentioned the valley uh, and its mixed use character and the terraces, the planted terraces that we saw even mm. more plantings mm. going in as we walked around. Um, uh, you know, in talking about the mixed use nature of some of the more recent buildings, uh, as opposed to the uh, more office related uses uh, of the uh, commercial buildings that date back to the atrium, what, 20 years ago? Um, my, I, the question I would ask, and, 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 and I'm gonna also ask it through the words of Gary Friedman in the uh, chat room, uh, who Gary asked, is the planning for this project affected by evolving post pandemic work patterns uh, where in the US, at least there seems to be less demand for office space than previously. Is mixed right. use a result of hedging bets against that or are there other factors? And uh, I can tell you what Paco told us in the- uh, in, in Okay, the you wanna the start years. with that? <laughs> uh, well, um, you know, uh, what, what's your perception? You know, uh, okay, you know you're, perception. you're moving into a mixed use building of sorts. Yeah. Uh, 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 my, my, my perception is that the, uh, um, uh, the desire for mixed use actually predates the uh, uh, pandemic. Um, and I think it has to do with what, what we see works well in cities. Um, and also I, I referenced the Dutch tradition of placemaking and uh, um, the um, sort of the, the, the uh, thought that is given to shared space. Um, because we're all on top of each other. And I think you see the same thing in cities like New York. People know that they uh, literally have to uh, navigate uh, not just the, the, the built environment, but each other. Um, so I, I do think that that attitude uh, resonates and, and uh, came into the planning earlier um, to, the, to the question of uh, changed work habits. I was actually surprised a couple of times that I was in the, in the district recently, how many people are out and about. It's not just the uh, office workers. Uh, remember there's that university nearby. So you see lots and lots of uh, young people move through the space. And then even on uh, days here in the middle of the winter, you see people uh, uh, using the, the outdoor space. Um, I can show you image, images of plenty of people enjoying the outdoors uh, in, uh, on a nice summer day for lunch or after work gathering. Uh, but it's, uh, 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 it's actually uh, a very lively uh, district and it becomes more and more as we see more and more mixed use projects. But uh, so I don't, I don't think that one um, and the other are so linearly uh, related. Mm -hmm. So, but it's so, all driving towards the same thing, right? The 15 minute city and, and walkable uh, neighborhoods. Yeah, that, that kind of corroborates other things we heard uh, from others in Amsterdam in, in government and in, in private sector, uh, that the pandemic didn't have the same palpable effect on office use or future office use uh, that it seems to have had in New York. And, and New York is now bouncing back. The vacancy rate is going down uh, from what it was during the pandemic. But the one thing that the one takeaway that's kind of surprised me is that 
because of the lingering concern about people not wanting to share elevators for any length of time, that the lower floors of some buildings are becoming more popular than the upper floors, not just because they're more accessible by stairs. Uh, it was just an interesting uh, 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 side take. I'd like to come back to a fundamental question, and it was actually the first one in the chat room from uh, Christopher Fagan, who, among other distinctions, uh, has been a regional director, young architect, regional director for AI in New York State. And Chris uh, asked, uh, what was the catalyst uh, uh, for adopting this polycentric growth um, and, and infill instead of the uh, monocentric uh, plans that typify so many other you know, major cities in Europe and the U.S. And, and right. uh, you know, I, I was asking people continually, how does this district, you know, compare itself to uh, La Défense or, or Canary Wharf or other places that were done seemingly as high-rise enclaves on the edge or, or, or uh, proximate to the city, but, but, but not in the historic center? Uh, you know, were those other developments to prevent overwhelming the center of an historic and beautiful city with with high rise modern buildings, mm -hmm. you know, or was there some other fundamental issue of uh, of identity? Uh, uh, you know, everything is so interconnected in the Netherlands. You could be in Rotterdam in no time and Delft even sooner. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, what, so why, I have I have that? a personal take. It's not very academic, and it's certainly. Uh, um, there's probably more to it, but, but one of the things that uh, a city like Amsterdam has been is experiencing even before the pandemic is the, uh, there's only so much the city can handle. So uh, there's been an enormous uh, pushback locally from uh, tourism, uh, Airbnb, um, you know, people, an influx of people who all want to be at the heart of the city, including ourselves, the people that live there, work there, shop there, uh, and need to get around. And so this tension uh, by, by sort of concentrating everything uh, at, at, at one uh, center of the city was uh, people were, were feeling that, uh, uh, you know, well, well before we're, we've like been talking about it. So, the, uh, so I think a part of the, the, this, this acceptance of uh, polycentric in the case of Amsterdam certainly has to do with the, um, yeah, the carry weight of, of like how much the, 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 the bones of a city can handle, right? So, um, and uh, the, the other thing is, um, I think the, the um, the need for housing and um, the uh, sort of the, the, like I said, taking full advantage of the uh, connections to transit and the proximity to the airport, for instance, and then European high-speed rail connections, the fact that you can now hop on the train to London, um, you know, from where I'm living, literally I'm 10 minutes away from a train uh, to, uh, that, that will take me to, to Paris or, or uh, the UK uh, starts to really, really compete with air travel, which is the other consideration, right? So it's, it's a combination of local, regional, uh, national and, and uh, international uh, things that I think all together sort of uh, created this momentum to, to say it out loud and put it in, a, in, a, in your planning uh, effort. Yeah. I'd like to come back to a fundamental issue that was uh, overarching, overwhelming. You, you mentioned in passing the extent of public funding for all the mm -hmm. improvements that were seen in the district. Yeah. But you also mentioned almost as a throwaway uh, the degree, and there was, a, there was also a diagram of public land ownership in Amsterdam, uh, yeah. which is paralleled. Uh, uh, and, and many of the properties uh, are on long-term leaseholds rather than on owned property. Uh, Nitin Patel had a question about private property acquisition, and I presume mm -hmm. that uh, is pertaining to this district in particular. Um, does the government own all of the underlying real estate and are developers putting projects on these parcels with 50 or 99 year leases? Uh, his question, extended, mm -hmm. you know, does acquisition compare, how does it compare to New York City? But, you know, what is the uh, nature of uh, property ownership in the Netherlands and in particular in this district of Amsterdam? Right. 
So in this particular case, uh, even in the, uh, the earlier uh, master plan from 1998, uh, it mentions the fact that most of the land already is publicly owned. And that had to do with, and now I'm taking you all the way back to that 1934 plan uh, that identified this area for future growth. So in, in those early planning efforts, there's a lot of there were a lot of reservations made for future growth and typically that was uh, uh, publicly owned land. Um, so the, uh, the initial strategy was really to maximize uh, uh, public uh, ownership and then for the, um, there, there were leases, of, especially for recreational purposes. There were a number of uh, sports facilities and the city um, just decided not to renew those. And then I think there were a couple of minor uh, sites left. Uh, and in the Netherlands, like in the US, you can uh, um, uh, use uh, eminent domain, but in this case, it was friendly eminent domain. Um, so there was a lot of effort put in negotiating uh, sort of uh, you know, acceptable uh, um, uh, deals with with landowners, but it, it started out as as mostly publicly owned, and so yeah, the 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 development in this area is on land that still is publicly owned with leases that are uh, um, uh, in, in perpetuity. Sorry, uh, so that that would be ninety nine uh, uh, year leases, and it's a it's a whole system and a very recent change was made and there are now more options for people to buy off the future um, sort of leases so you can opt to pay a, a, an annual um, uh, rent basically or you could uh, uh, buy it off in, in all at once and of course there's a difference between uh, commercial owners and and uh, uh, you know, homeowners, um, but uh, uh, yeah, and and it, it, I think it it's a and there's there is a legal protection. It's not like the government can can knock on your door and say I, I need it back. Never mind that there is a, a twenty story building on top of it. That's um, I don't know enough about that to explain it to you, but um, I think it's it's well accepted by the market and the developers that it's, this is how it works in the Netherlands uh, in a lot of places, but particularly in Amsterdam. So it's not like, it, there's no point as a developer to go come in and start debating something that has been in place for centuries and basically is, is uh, how the city uh, funds. So, so and, it's, and it, it's, uh, it's one o'clock here in New York, uh, but we started five minutes late. So I'm gonna ask three more questions coming from members of the audience and they're all pretty, quick and easy, I think, maybe the more complicated, but, but the, the, the next one up, because it's sort of a follow-up to the other pandemic-related question is from Bonnie Harkin. She's uh, asking about the nature of public space and uh, as planning of the open space and public areas at, in, the, in, this, in the district changed because of the pandemic or changed because of the density. You mentioned that the station will accommodate 250,000 yeah. people. My yeah. recollection is that there are 2.4 million people in the metropolitan area and about 900,000 people or so in Amsterdam proper. Uh, that's uh, a, a lot of people clamoring for open space at yeah. this time. In other words, what's changed? Yeah. I think uh, from day one, the quality of the space, that was that was like a front and center, even in that early master plan. So the, the, the ambition uh, to achieve uh, uh, high quality uh, outcomes is, is, is absolutely there. I do think that um, there may be uh, uh, a, sh a shift towards more uh, usable space uh, rather than, uh, or active space rather than just passive uh, spaces. And there's definitely, uh, there was always uh, um, uh, a desire for trees, but I think now more and more, we really want big trees, not just start with little sticks in, 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 an, in an environment like this. So my, my colleagues at Arcadis, for instance, uh, the landscape architects are working on, the, on that, that, that uh, plaza and on both sides of the station. Um, I, I call that uh, human-centric uh, uh, landscape design 
which of course needs to withstand the, the, the number of people that come through it, but at the same time um, really feel uh, human scaled. And, the, and you do that with a lot of green and, and uh, really full grown trees. So does uh, that answer your question? Yeah, perfectly. I'm, uh, uh, we're gonna get two more. Uh, uh, the next to last is from uh, uh, Jasmine Nevera, who uh, is uh, the head of uh, Creative Exchange Lab, uh, uh, which um, co-sponsors this uh, series of talks. Uh, her question has to do with public participation. Uh, I'll hold up. Yeah. Part of yeah. It. You know, and Paco is talking about transforming the district from what was perceived as an enclave or fortress into a yeah. connected and, and yeah. welcoming public yeah. forum. But what her question was was pretty literal. Uh, 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 are there uh, is there mapping of uh, assets, heritage, arts, cultural assets that guide decision making and planning? And I think she may be talking about all of Amsterdam and not just this relatively new right. district. But essentially, it's about interactivity. Is there something online? How does the public participate in planning decisions? Right. Um, well, I mean, I mentioned that that information center that is open to the public. You, you don't have to be a planning nerd like me or a professional to uh, walk in there. And I do see uh, people uh, walking in there. Um, it, 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 um, but then, so it's interesting. I, I have worked for a business improvement district in New York, like uh, Rick mentioned, and we really don't have that uh, same model the way that uh, um, bids take ownership and, and really go beyond just... Uh, um, you know, keeping it, it clean, um, but they do have an organization in the in the, in, in the district called Hello Zuidas. That's what the thing that, yeah, and yeah. that organization doesn't just do promotion and marketing. They do uh, uh, also a lot of uh, events that are for the general public, not just uh, office workers. And um, I see uh, a lot of emphasis on things like art public art uh, or temporary installations. Um, and um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, a day of construction, they open up the district for people who want to see with their own eyes what's going on. Um, and they actually allow people to look into those uh, construction uh, uh, sites and talk about it. And um, I remember way back when after 9-11, I talked to uh, Bob, uh, Bob Yero. He was still the president of uh, RPA because mm. I had been to Berlin. And in Berlin, there was also this giant uh, construction site and they had this red box and it was an info box and you could climb in it and it allowed. And I said to, to uh, Bob, uh, we need to do something like that. That is a way to make it tangible to, for people. And give them, uh, I know it's not the participation you were talking about, but I, I do think that in, for, for uh, major transformations, especially with, with all this, this uh, infrastructure work going on, it's really important to um, not just talk to, again, to planning professionals or, or the real estate industry, but really also the regular people who uh, uh, are, are genuinely interested and it does help to build support for this kind of development. But um, that, that's a long winded answer. Um, there's a ton of participation is actually too much to 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 sort of I don't know how to because uh, I also work for community work. So I kind of know how things work in New York. I can tell you that there's there's a lot more talking in this country. I actually have to I have so to get used one to last the whole. Final, one last final question. I should know yeah. the answer. And I and I yeah. Kate Dunham asked uh, if the guidelines that you referenced for the district uh, are yeah. available online somewhere and, he's, and we could all see them, even if they're attached. Right. I'm sure they are. Um, I'm actually throwing this back to you, Rick, because you did talk to Paco in his yeah. uh, he's a city government you know, official. When, when, sure when, I, when I saw walking around, walking around with you is how, how they were uh, evidenced, you know, the, the, the materials in the landscape, the, the quality of the public space, street furniture and lighting, um, all were um, very well thought out, very well designed. And, and I was told, and it was pretty obvious, uh, 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 required by, by, by guidelines, which are increasingly focusing on sustainability, which is why we are so delighted 
Renee, that you were able to join us today. Uh, there was one other question from Miguel Batiara. He said, does Arcadis do all the sustainability consulting in-house or do you partner with other uh, firms, individuals, organizations uh, to provide the services that your firm provides? So you know, wonderfully. Uh, Both, and intern, extern. And actually that very, very early slide about our um, sustainability is in our DNA. There's a, the whole storyline about how we joined uh, forces with you in Habitat. Uh, very early on, we participate in the World Council for uh, Sustainable uh, Development um, and, and uh, actually a lot of other initiatives. So we're certainly not just inward. We're certainly not uh, um, um, doing it all. We are happy to partner and we, we well, actually thanks. are part of a number of partnerships. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think we've got to almost all the questions that came in uh, over the transom to the Q&A or the chat room. Uh, I had more I might have asked and that probably asked already when we were together, but I can't yeah. thank you enough. This has been uh, amazing. I'd like to uh, put in one more plug for uh, uh, the uh, Consortium for Sustainable uh, Urbanization. Uh, its gala will be uh, at the Century and online on March 23rd. And membership is possible through the website, which not surprisingly is consortium for sustainable urbanization.org. Uh, my pleasure to uh, again thank you all for participating, for staying the course. And Renee, it's always a pleasure. I hope to see you again soon in New York. Yeah. I miss you, New bye York. Everybody. Thank you for having me. <laughs> bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye.